Design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. Famous words from San Francisco-born Apple co-founder Steve Jobs. However, a design should also be safe and sustainable. The EU's chemical strategy for sustainability aims to achieve a toxic-free environment and wants to assure that chemicals are produced and used in a way that maximizes their contribution to society while avoiding harm to the planet. Is this one small step for policymakers but a giant leap for industry? What is needed to create a shift towards the new chemicals and materials that are inherently safe and sustainable from their creation to end of life? What could be the criteria for safe and sustainable my design? And many more questions I will discuss with Jürgen Tietje from the European Commission and Josef Wunsch from Suschem. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Josef, let's start with a short introduction on Suschem. Yeah, um, thank you for having me, Tiet. Um, Suschem is a <coughs> European technology platform that was founded in 2004 um, by the European Commission. Um, the founding members are from academia, so uh, the German so uh, Society for Chemistry, uh, the Royal Society, the Brits were still part of the EU at that time, but also CEFIC, uh, the Association from, um, for the Chemical Industry. Uh, no chemical industry. Europe Bio was also part of that. Um, the initial aim was really to foster innovation on sustainable chemistry, re-innovate um, biochemistry, and uh, we have been contributing to the uh, sustainable innovation research agenda. We have DG RTD and uh, DG Grow on our board as observers. Uh, lately, we have been heavily involved in uh, safe and sustainable by design discussions. We are part of IRIS. We also contributed to the transition pathway um, of um, uh, the chemical industry by DG, initiated by DG Grow, the Advanced Materials in Initiative um, that Jürgen and his team initiated. Um, SASCHEM now has run about 3,200 members uh, from industry, small and medium entities, uh, startups, um, academia, institutes like uh, RTOs, Fraunhofer Institute, um, RISE and so on and so forth. That's, that's SASCHEM. Now we are shaping our profile this year uh, because our role becomes more and more to advise uh, organs from the European Commission on certain documents. Jürgen, in December 2022, the EU Commission published its recommendations for establishing a European assessment framework for safe and sustainable by design. Can you outline the principles of this framework? With pleasure. Um, you said, is it a big step or a small step in your introduction? It's actually step by step. And it's not even criteria for a specific substance or for a specific chemical. It's a framework and it's a testing framework. So for the next two or three years, we would like to engage with the chemical industries, with research institutes and others. What can, how can we find a common understanding when it comes to future chemicals, alternatives to substance of concern? We will not be able to remove all substance of concern in the daily world, we can't. But when I think we start innovating and research on alternatives, where do we want to go? There, after a long stakeholder process, and also after having looked at the overall studies which are actually around, we tried to make a testing framework which is composed of composed of two big blocks. The first is if you start designing a new chemical, think a little bit about not only the, mo mo the molecules, but also think about process and product at the end. But this is more an invitation. The crucial phase is, and this is triggering lots of debate, is there should be an assessment. We would like, okay, we will put safety first, that's the starting point of the recommendation. I'm pretty sure we'll have a debate on this later on as well. But we would like to go a little bit further and not only wait for data which we have under legislation, but look also at environmental impact and many other things. So we actually we have four steps. First are the hazardous properties through so the hazard profile. We have the risk for the workers who are sitting in the production and the process. We have, at the end, the exposure when it comes to the final application of the products. And we have also a life cycle assessment looking at the environment. This is quite ambitious. It requires a big debate also how we will get the data. But we put this forward. And of course, uh, one controversial point which is hinted at the recommendation is a bit, how do we deal with social economic aspects? 
but I'm sure we will come back to this. Yeah, so basically there are four and a half steps if we take into account the socio-economic aspects. Let's do them step by step. So let's start with the first step, which is uh, the hazard assessment of the chemical and the material. Who wants to start? Maybe I can comment on what, what Jürgen just said. So first of all, I we highly appreciate that we are now invited in, in, in the dis discussion in the evaluation period yeah. of the, the framework. Um, <coughs> it, was, it was laid open and um, yeah, I have, probably have to say that safe and sustainable by design was a term that was created um, in the chemical strategy for sustainability um, and there was, it sounds good, but there was no clarity what is it. And now uh, DGRTD took the initiative and um, putting a framework out. Um, even though I have to say that still, and you said it, Jürgen, basically, um, the approach is very much on the safety side. Um, and we have regulatory um, instruments in Europe, like REACH, like the CLP, that is already, already addressing the safety, uh -huh. uh, the, the, the uh -huh. hazardousness of materials. Um, and it still contains a cut-off criteria. Mm -hmm. That we are not happy with, um, and mm -hmm. uh, to put out a little bit more, a, a little bit more meat on the bone, we had three test cases. Uh, we were invited for that. Uh, one, um, they were all assessed together with us, industry representatives and the JRC, the Joint Research Center. Uh, one was picked by um, JRC. It was the plasticizer. We had flame retardancy, and we had enzymes that coming from Novo enzymes uh, for laundry. Um, an enzyme per se is a, well, I have to say that none of these materials passed the first step. Um, enzymes per se are reactive substances. They are designed. We have thousands of, of enzymes mm -hmm. in our body mm -hmm. and in any split second of our life they cut molecules. They do organic harm mm -hmm. in our body, designed by evolution. Um, in a washing detergent environment, an enzyme is doing very much the same, basically cutting uh, fatty acids, sweat from the textile so that it smells clean. So it has respiratory aspects. Um, this is not regulated by REACH because REACH, well, these enzymes passed, proteases, uh, all the other substance passed. Now they didn't pass the SSPD concept. Um, what you typically do in, a, in such an environment, you block the active center to protect um, uh, humans. It's, it's basically a salt. Once you put the enzyme with the salt into uh, water, salt gets dissolved and the enzyme can be active. So it's intrinsically safe. Okay. Um, but when you look at single substances according to SSPD, as we have it on the, on the table now, it does not pass. And again, it is... Um, uh, not regulated, it's not as stringent um, as it is um, by REACH as it is now with um, SSPD. Mm -hmm. And it, it requires a lot of data, I have to say. We have been working with three employees on one single case for five months. Mm -hmm. um, this is not applicable in the innovation phase. When yeah. you have a molecule in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the lab, you don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, so the data, ma data maturity evolves over time. And 90, 95% of the molecules that you have initially in the lab, you throw away because they don't perform. Mm -hmm. okay. in a, in a okay, can, I, can I stop you yeah. for a, a short sure. moment? Because we, uh, uh, you mentioned the three uh, case studies, and I think, uh, but I'm a layman mm -hmm. here, that that's why there are case studies here, hey, to get lessons mm -hmm. learned. Yeah, sure. So what I would like to do, uh, take the flame retardants, the plasticizers, and the enzymes in mind then, go step by step through the four and a half steps of uh, uh -huh. the framework uh -huh. and see where they go. And, and, uh -huh. and I know that also for the three examples, uh, uh, especially the enzymes, if they didn't even pass the first step, they still went on to get lessons learned. So let's try to focus also on the lessons learned and let's begin with step one, the hazard assessment uh -huh. of the chemical and the material. Uh, Jürgen. Yeah, I think I will not now reopen all the case studies because they are not closed. What we are actually doing, we start a process to see also where we would like actually to land. Because at the end point is, and this is correct that uh, uh, Josef is, is, is criticizing the question of data, we have to build a process actually, how can we collect the data, can we exchange the data, this regard. 
That's the first point I would like to make. The other point which is heavily criticized very often is the step one, if you don't pass the step one, if you're not safe, you cannot be safe and sustainable by design. Does this mean it is prohibited? No. Our logic is a frontliner logic. So you should then not go out, you are safe and sustainable by design. That is actually the logic, if all this materialized, because I think at the workshop we're having, as was a quite open discussion, I think that, that's what I understood. Huh? Yeah, I and I'm pretty sure there will be more test cases to come. Uh, maybe I stop at this stage. Yeah, so the, the hazard assessment there, uh, yeah. th that's a challenge and it's pretty similar to the hazard assessment under REACH basically, yeah? Yes, I think we cannot pass a safety test and be lower than REACH. Let's together uh, take step yeah. two and look into the identification of human health and safety aspects of production and processing in the workplace. I think it comes back also uh, when, when you look at it at, from the innovation perspective. Um, early on in, in an innovation perspective, from an innovation perspective, you do not have that amount of data that is currently requested. Mm -hmm. We are learning from that. So it, it, mm -hmm. it, I'm not criticizing, basically th that's a learning, that's an observation. Mm -hmm. It's very bureaucratic. Um, and in terms of safety for, for professionals, for workers, um, I dare to say that in Europe we have the best uh, labor protection laws uh, mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the planet. Because, and I would, you know, we have, we have the differentiation between professional and consumer. I would encourage to have um, industrial, including lab, including academia, and I'll tell you why, um, professional and consumer. Uh, industrial, lab, academia, these people are skilled, they are trained at university uh, in, in a printer's program. Um, they know how to deal with substances <coughs> of uncertainty. When you're in the lab and you don't know what the substance is all about, you wear full protection, even FFP3 masks. You, you learn how to do things under the hood. <coughs> People in the plant learn to deal with that. I would leave it up to the innovators, the edu education program, how to deal with hazardous materials in the early and in the industrial phase. Professionals, I agree, we have to improve. Professionals is basically using a chemical, formulating it, mm -hmm. um, painters, uh, foam uh, application in construction mm -hmm. and so on. Typically, we cannot guarantee all across Europe that these people have a, a solid training, what this is, what the, the, the danger is about. And then on consumers completely agreed, um, they must not be contaminated with any hazardous materials. Yeah. I think yeah. a, a sophisticated approach could be very helpful here. And again, for early um, innovation phase, the big program, as you as you presented it, is just not working. Yeah, so it's basically leaning on the safety aspects, yeah. uh, as you say. Well, yeah. what is I think your on the safety there? aspects, we are leaning mainly on the risk for the workers. Yeah? yeah. Do you have any dermal exposure? Do you have any inhalation risk? And I think there the debate is out on the different models, one from ECHA, one from others. And yeah. uh, and I think we will here and so far listen to what is said. But on the other hand, if we have serious risk. What do we do then? No one will actually disagree in this regard. So for me, I think it seems to be more that we need to have further discussion in this regard than not start saying it's not going to work. The point <coughs> of it is about the early innovators, okay, about those who are in the laboratory. But here, I think we need to discuss this a bit further and because what I see a bit is a tendency and I would say the framework should not bite. It should be nice, but this is not our, not, our, not our target. At a certain time it has to bite and then we have to see is this a, a credible point mm -hmm. or is it actually not feasible for the industry. Yeah? Yeah, for, for me as an outsider it seems mm -hmm. a little bit that you have zoomed out of certain steps that already happened under mm -hmm. REACH and try now again to focus again on certain aspects that have mm -hmm. some room for improvement basically. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot about safety. Uh, mm -hmm. When I attended the workshop, I was like, where is the sustainable part? Is that also part of the steps or is... is well, I think environment plays a role. It plays a role in the step one, it plays a role in the step two. It will then pose, I think, a major issue when it comes to the 
last uh, stage. This is actually the life cycle assessment, which will be an, a challenge. Yeah. That will be a <coughs> challenge, but there it's mm. really coming in. Yeah. And it should be, as I said, not at the level of regulation, it should be at the level of innovation. That actually, what, what we intend to, what should come out of it? What should we, if I may say so, also fund as a public funder yeah. when it comes to research and innovation? We will come back to this question. Yeah, no, no, let's, let's keep step four, huh, the life cycle analysis yeah. and the yeah. product yeah. environmental yeah. footprint. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do step three first. Uh, and that's about the identification of human health and environmental risks in the mm -hmm. use phase. Mm -hmm. Can you go first? Yeah, I think without now repeating myself, I think uh, here we have had a discussion uh, in this regard in the workshop. We will see, we will have further discussions in this regard. But on the final application phase, again, it's a matter not only for me in terms of safety, but also in terms of sustainability where we want to go. And um, the application risk needs to be looked at. but. As I said, we are fairly open here in this regard. Yeah, I think that's what I would like to add at this stage. Perfect. Do you want to add anything yeah, on step I can, three? I can, uh, from, from my perspective, um, step three and step two could easily be combined. Mm -hmm. um, that will, we will discuss. This, this. That is, no, no, but this um, is a testing framework. A, uh, yeah. Step three for me is, a, is just an extension of step two. Yeah. Um, and I, I, sorry, I have to come back to the same thing. If you apply the same kind of logic, um, to have all mm -hmm. the data early on created. It, it works for, let's say, for a substance that is developed, that is in use mm -hmm. already, that mm -hmm. even you know how to dispose it or how mm -hmm. to uh, make it circular. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you take that into consideration for existing materials, doable. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you're in an innovation process, and really we want to in, uh, mm -hmm. incentivize innovation, mm -hmm. um, especially for small and medium entities, they don't have the capabilities, the financing power, mm -hmm. because they would have to hand out the material for certain tests uh, mm -hmm. to get all the data. Uh, it's more inhibitive to, pro, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to innovation. I would recommend, um, we presented from an industrial institute perspective, uh, a tool called ProScale, mm -hmm. looking at the whole life cycle of a material, mm -hmm from early on research, uh, scaling up production, uh, use, disposal, circularity, um, having certain measures, so toxicology institutes mm -hmm. were involved in that, mm -hmm. mainly focusing on human health at this point in time. We are expanding that now um, into environmental. Um, yeah, if Zero pollution, if pollution we call it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think, well, I have to say that, that industry and institutes, we are already addressing sustainability and safety. So let's work together. Mm -hmm. um, we have a methodology, we presented it to JRC. Um, they were very receptive to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's, let's work together in, in a co-creation process to make best mm -hmm. use of what is on the table and what mm -hmm. is digestible, in particular for startups and small and medium entities. Yeah, so your biggest concern is more for the SMEs than for the bigger companies because they already made these steps. My boss will definitely not like to spend millions and millions for testing that I know. <laughs> okay. And um, Jürgen, on the environmental sustainability assessment, eh, the life cycle assessment, the product environmental footprint, uh, can you share more information on that that may well, be linked to lessons learned? We use the instruments from DG Environment when it comes to life cycle assessment and we look at the whole range. Huh? from extracting yeah. raw materials until recycling, which is of course enormous, but we use actually in existing methodologies. Clearly here, when it comes to future innovation, that will be a challenge uh, in this regard. And there, again, we have a bit to see which other examples will come up, but this is in essence a new component. And I think people expect not to separate safety only and not to look at the environment. We can have, of course, you raise the question, should we now, is it more sustainability? Should we actually not put safety under the umbrella of sustainability? But this is a debate which I will not reopen. We had this. Now, if we why, keep why, why, the abbreviation, you can make it <laughs> sustainable and safe by design. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, would, yeah. I would pick up that point and say, why don't you think about, or why don't we discuss separation of safety? That becomes a regulatory. Mm -hmm. aspect and sustainability, which is, let's say, the guiding principle for the innovation part. Yeah, that brings us a bit back again to the question about innovation. What do we want to innovate? 
if we have substance of concern and so we're a bit going beyond the world of regulation and you have an innovation going on, I would like to look for an alternative. Which alternative we would like to have? We don't want to have, I use the classical term, regrettable substitution. No one wants to have this. Where will we actually go in this regard? How will we drive research innovation in this regard? Because mm. that's the other challenge. Yeah, if we you drive want research to keep in on innovating, yes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, but if the innovation is something which is not in terms of paying off, that's a big yeah, issue for public funding. Huh? That's a big issue for public funding. But also for industry. I mean, yeah. if you innovate and you, you can't get your return on investment, <coughs> then, then again, Joseph Boss will uh, <laughs> yeah. not be happy. And a substance of concern is also a term that has not been defined. And uh, it's defined a bit. Yeah, it, it's a yeah. bit. Yeah, but uh, we still need some work. Um, and yeah. also uh, the enzymes. Coming back to the enzymes, that would be a substance on this of concern because it has respiratory effects. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think we have to look a little bit on the end, end use. The step four perfect worked mm -hmm. perfectly for mm -hmm. established mm -hmm. chemicals because yeah. you have the whole life cycle. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. the innovation piece, it would be theoretical and then yeah. it would be yeah. waste. Yeah. <coughs> An interesting question when it comes yeah. to the end use will be when we are reading really the world of circular economy. Yeah? Absolutely because this is one of my biggest concerns also when I hear about this step one, uh, this should not be a hierarchy, we should do it differently, but if you're in the world of circular economy, really across value chains, urban mining and all these things, how do you measure this? How will you go about it? I think it will be very difficult. And if we talk about innovation, is this a time frame of five to ten years? Do you know what matters? 8.8. 8.8. <laughs> Wonderful. <coughs> okay, where we will stand with recyclability and circular economy in ten years? Will be Joseph, can I give um, you the question? We, it will be. It will be. We, I well, think companies um, speak a lot about it. Uh, um, honestly, Jürgen, I have a sober look on that. Uh, you know, many of the value chains that we are addressing have developed over 30, 50, 80 years, mm -hmm. automotive 100 years. And this is typically not one chemical producer into the next final application. It is a lot of intermediate companies, small and medium companies. Mm -hmm. They have learned to optimize. They bought equipment. They bought, uh, they, they um, did everything from the, the regulatory per, uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. If you want to change the whole value chain, mm -hmm. that's not done in 8.8 .8 years. They, to, to make that circular, no, but definitely, if, if they you look, need definitely if time. If you look at the upcoming debate on the critical raw materials and raw materials, this is currently, people yeah. start thinking about yeah. it. Because I think the supply chains as regards chemicals and materials are changing drastically due to an unfortunate geopolitical yeah. development. So people start thinking in terms of circular economy, recyclability, also in different ways. And we have to see how where we will go in the next 10 years. I think it's important for industry. It's important. Uh, it's still under development, so it's really tough for me to make a final assessment here. Mm -hmm. um, again, I see co uh, invitation to, to discuss it jointly, mm -hmm. uh, what the impact mm -hmm. is and how, how we make that a little bit more tangible. Yeah. Um, we touched upon this. We have officially four steps in the recommendation. We touched yeah. on the issue and you have seen that the work, the Joint Research Center started, embraces already all the social aspects, forced labor, child labor, mm. fair salary, etc., etc. I think the tricky question on the economic side will be what do we understand by this? Because if it's about profitability and investments, and this you would like to weigh against safety, I think that's a very hard message. I think no one wants to do this. Uh, and that is, I think we have to see where we will land and there will still need a, indeed further work, no doubt. Jürgen, based on the first experiences eh, with the framework, uh, is it already possible to define some of the parameters for what is safe and what is sustainable? I think that's too early. We have had a first workshop with test cases and you see it's it triggers lots of controversial points, which is good. Uh, we will actually in the next two years have more workshops. No, for me it's clearly too early now to draw parameters. This is a framework which we have. We're also expecting actually more input also from the member states. I know for instance the Dutch government is very interested and very active. And we will see also in Spain there's lots of movement. So we have also to see which feedback we will get from them under their national research programs 
and under the, the, from their National Research Institutes. So I'm a bit careful in already setting out parameters beyond what is in the Commission recommendation. Josef, do you already see an outline of a potential SSBD flowchart? No, not yet. Uh, okay. uh, I completely uh, aligned with Jürgen here that um, it's too early to make that assessment at this point in time. Again, industry is already working on sustainability and safety. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we, have, we have a lot of regulatory by reach on um, mm -hmm. labor mm -hmm. safety um, requirements. And um, we have had a workshop with uh, the World Business Council for, Sa uh, for Sustainable Development. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, the, the uh, portfolio uh, sustainability assessment from um, developed by them. So it, it's something, there is already something on the table. So let's work together <coughs> to make that uh, a meaningful innovation tool. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Joseph, uh, already on the table is an initiative supported by SESCAM on the Advanced Materials yep. 2030 initiative. Can you tell us more about that initiative? Yeah, it was, uh, the initiative was initiated by uh, DGRTT. <coughs> Okay. Um, it was presented as a manifesto mid of last year in Grenoble at the INTEC. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, a long discussion. It's, it's basically addressing nine different innovation markets, value chains, being packaging, construction, automotive, um, electronic devices for household goods, healthcare, agro, and so on and so forth. Um, jointly with other European technology platforms being next to Suschem, Emiri, Oymat and uh, Manufuture. We have in the meantime 200 experts on the job um, developing a roadmap. I just saw the second solid, good draft, I have to say, and it still needs some, some uh, ref, um, refinement. Um, we are trying to identify, and we have found some common denominators, commonalities, like circularity, certain features on biodegradability, digital tools how to predict, but then it has to go into one or the other value chain. So you have chemicals serving the, the healthcare market as well as a construction uh, industry. So it's about to be finished in a few weeks, I would say, and then mm -hmm. uh, by end of this year probably or later this year, we will advise on um, what could be a financing instrument to get these things done in the remaining seven years. Okay, you want to add something on this? Two points. First is for us an important stakeholder initiative. We are very sympathetic because I think we should look at advanced materials also from a point of view of technology sovereignty. So far, and so it's quite rightly, we're looking into, okay, what do we need on batteries? Yeah. And but batteries was driving everything, which is good, which was needed. But we are actually looking also across the board, across different applications, what is needed. Other jurisdictions do this. If you look at the number of patents in the world, I don't think that Europe is leading anymore. And we are not number two. We even. So I think we look at it from the technology sovereignty point as well. And therefore, and in Europe, we face a bit the issue that we are not bad, but maybe we are a bit too scattered. And, and not a strategic bit too enough. Bureaucratic, I have to say. Yeah, and too, uh, too scattered <coughs> and not strategic enough. No. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The aim of the SSBD framework is to steer innovation and become a global reference and accelerate the development of alternatives mm -hmm. to substances of concern. What kind of financial support programs are available to make this happen? Well, first of all, the recommendation addresses, is addressed to member states that they start embedding safe and sustainable by design in their research programs, and I hope it's going to happen. In an event, we have the European Research Programme, which is Horizon Europe, and we do it in two ways. Uh, we foresee specific research topics, one, for instance, on computational modelling, which is absolutely needed. Uh, and we are waiting here for proposals for call actually in these weeks on social economic impact assessments as well. So we are focusing on the one hand on specific research topics. We have networks which look at actually the effects across value chains. So we actually, we are funding, organize lots of, if I say so, not advanced materials, but real materials to bring it also into the future debate. The second point is we put a clear marker whenever it comes to research topics under Horizon Europe. 
which could be linked to advanced materials at large, to energy, even to graphene, we put a bit of mark on say it should be driven by the term safe and sustainable by design where we're heading. We have not yet a final framework but we wanted to give a strong message and not have a total freedom of research because we are public funding so we have to defend public interest. So enough budget I think is available in this regard also to drive this forward. Okay, Joseph, does this help your innovation? Um, uh, it helps. Um, <coughs> we have to reduce bureaucracy. Still it takes too long to get a a proposal through. Mm -hmm. um, every, well, y you have improved, in, or the, the, the instruments have improved, but still we need between six and nine months before you have, uh, let's say, the program rolling. And when you look into, let's say, Advanced Materials Initiative 2030, waiting for six months is pretty long, I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, so less bureaucracy. Um, I'm completely with you. Um, you, with the data infrastructure, we are not by far not there. That needs a lot of investment. Mm. We don't have a Gaia X for chemicals. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it's just. But it's um, it's it's not going hap to happen by itself. So mm. you need templates. Uh, you need, uh, let's say, a standardization mm. that all needs to be financed. And again, small medium entities will not have the financing yeah. power to do that. Yeah. Also, um, more data will be requested. Whether this is by reach extension <coughs> uh, or the new classification. Uh, regulation or whatever comes through SSPD. Um, therefore, also we need financing power to get all the data uh, retrieved from whatever test we are doing. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, I said it, um, to change a value chain from a linear into a circular value chain. Again, you know, we are aiming for it and I'm completely with you. We need to keep the carbon in the loop. We need to have, let's say, whatever resources out there mm -hmm. making best use of that, mm -hmm. yet that requires change of equipment, change of oh, processes yes. and um, at this point in time uh, certain processes are not defined mm -hmm. uh, so there are multiple options so it's also a little bit of risk catching I have to say what we need from a, a financing instrument. Okay, a very important question, will safe and sustainable by design become a regulatory requirement? It's a recommendation what we have, and we are aiming for another recommendation. So the answer is no. How, well, how not will, yet. No. The answer is no. How it will be in five or ten years, this I can't tell you. Eh? But I think the no. But I, no. But I think it's clear. It's a testing framework. We have not even a system where we would like to identify criteria for substance of concern. We are not even there, even to make a recommendation. So. I think I would be very careful and using the term it's a regulation. I know at, at higher levels in chemical companies people think about it but we are not yet there. Let's wait for the REACH reform if it is coming. <laughs> yeah. What are for the two of you the ambitions and expectations for the SSBD? For me first it should be an international reference point where Europe stands. Citizens are in Europe are very interested and even very concerned about safety and environment. We should never underestimate this. Maybe citizens and other economies mm -hmm. of the world think differently. Uh, that's the first point. On the other hand, I would say it's important that we have a common understanding what we mean by this. I don't want to end up with the Tower of Babel. So we have so many languages and no one knows, uh, knows actually what we're talking about because citizens will expect this. Okay, Joseph? Um, yeah, for from my perspective, um, we have to really, when it comes down to safety, that should be somehow related to reach. It should be, yeah, put into reach. Maybe just separate it, and then the sustainability part should give the guiding principle how to develop alternatives. Um, whatever is out there to be changed, and we will see that in a few months. Um, we need guiding rails what is in and what is out what is considered as sustainable again i would not put too much emphasis on on the early phase uh, a staggered approach step by step uh, accumulating data let's make it pragmatic let's make it an innovation tool let's make it a business case for europe okay thank you for sharing your views on the ssbd framework and its implementation Steve Jobs already said, we're here to put a dent in the universe. Otherwise, why else even be here? For today, we can safely conclude, safe and sustainable by design, no rocket science. But there's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm.